credentials here. He has a bachelor's degree in physics from William and Mary, and then also a master's degree in physics from the University of Virginia. Uh, and uh, sort of coincidentally with his uh, master's in physics, he worked on a master's in environmental engineering here at Michigan Tech uh, in our Peace Corps Master's International Program. Uh, he served in the Peace Corps in Uganda, and I was lucky enough to get to visit him there. It's my first time to Africa, and uh, I love seeing, he was a great host, toured me around the country. That was really a highlight of, uh, really a highlight of my time here at Michigan Tech. Um, after uh, graduating here from here, Jonathan went to the University of Virginia again uh, for his PhD in environmental engineering, and now he's a postdoctoral research associate at Yale in their Climate and Energy, Energy Institute and also their Chemical and Environmental Engineering Department. And starting in January, he will be a professor at the University of Connecticut focusing on international water resources development. So uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about his, his past work, uh, some of his recent research, and, and I think I have some guidance for us as well. So thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for inviting me today, and I'm very happy to talk to you about the complexities of water, health, and climate. Um, so I, I like to get all the thank yous um, out of the way um, at the beginning because all these sorts of international projects, as I think you've heard, are really team members. Um, so of course, I'm going to be talking about uh, my work in Michigan Tech with uh, Professor Watkins and Professor uh, Helsick, uh, Open Palm Wesser, which was the organization I worked for in Uganda, as well as the University of Virginia. My advisor is Professor Snell in Dillingham, all of the other researchers and students, as well as our colleagues at the University of Benda in South Africa, Dr. Sammy, Professor Dama, and Ali Piso, field team, as well as uh, Yale University and uh, all of our uh, lab research group there, as well, of course, as the uh, group from UC Berkeley who we're currently collaborating with. Um, so, yeah, so when thinking about um, what I should talk about today, I thought I would frame it in terms of a journey. And it's a journey that's been both a physical and a personal journey for me, but it's also been an intellectual one. And indeed, it's taken me from, from Michigan Tech, where I started here, this was about eight years ago, and uh, from my work in Guatemala and Uganda, to, as Dave was suggesting, my work at the University of Virginia, where I was primarily working in South Africa, to my current work with Yale's Climate and Energy Institute, where I'm conducting a project in Ubli Darwa, India. Last but not least, the future, where I'll be working as a professor at the University of Connecticut soon, and we'll be primarily working on projects in Ethiopia. So as mentioned, it's not only a personal physical journey that I've taken, but it's also been an intellectual one. Um, I started off in environmental engineering about eight years ago, as Dave mentioned, coming from physics, where I was studying nuclear and particle physics. So to me, these problems work, engineering problems, right? The community has a water problem, well, let, let's construct a well. And so that's where I started, but I quickly learned, as you'll see, that uh, the world is much more complicated than that. Uh, particularly when we're speaking about uh, water, uh, water security and health in, in these countries, we have all these sorts of different factors, many of the things we've been talking about today. Um, Everything from climate change to sanitation to um, you know desertification, all these sorts of other factors, and these are sorts of the other things that I currently study on an academic side, and things I'll bring up throughout today's talk. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, I first started off my first uh, real introduction to uh, international engineering work was with the uh, EWB Guatemala project. And uh, we did the first assessment trip down there, and I guess it was the spring of 2006, if I have my dates right. And I think these pictures are familiar to everybody here, um, very poor water resources. Um, however, we also found in that community that there are lots of other different confounding variables, right? So we had, of course, relatively poor uh, hygiene, as well as uh, poor sanitation. And women and children were primarily the ones collecting the water, which then had to be stored for long periods. So quickly, I learned that it's you know far more than just an engineering challenge. That work then led very naturally to my work in Uganda, where I worked as a water and sanitation engineer for a small organization called Open Palm Wesser. Here I am at, at the source of the Nile, early on in my service. 
So we conducted um, two main um, research projects when I was in Uganda, and both of these projects asked very simple questions, but we got some very interesting results. Um, the first of these projects was looking at rural water usage. So we asked basically, well, I guess it was 1,500 households in three different districts, how much water do you use? And then we asked a concurrent question, how far do you have to go to collect it, how long does it take you? And what we found was surprising. Traditionally, researchers had thought that people use um, a lot more water, particularly if it was close, and then if you had to go you know, several miles to go collect water, you are very likely to use you know, five liters or less per day. What we found is that people use pretty much about 15 liters per person per day, no matter how far they have to go to get it. And we explained this simply by saying that uh, you know, people need about 15 liters per person per day at the absolute minimum really, you know, just to do the sort of things that people need to do on a daily basis. The next study I did was also asking a simple question, but again, we got sort of a complicated result. Um, in this case, we worked on a project we entitled what, West work, what Works Best in Diarrheal Disease Prevention. So in this case, we um, chose five different communities near where I was working, and we implemented a different water or sanitation project in each one of these communities. First community, we implemented uh, biosand water filters. The next community, we improved their latrines. The third community, we uh, constructed a community water source. And then we um, did uh, hand washing promotion and constructed a simple um, tippy tap hand washing stations in the fourth community. And then the last community, we did a multiple interventions where we implemented all of these different interventions with the exception of the biosand water filters. We also included a lot more health and hygiene education in that community. So what did we find? Well, we found that the biosand filters work pretty well at preventing diarrheal diseases based on our survey results. But then we also found that multiple interventions also seem to be pretty effective. Um, but surprisingly, things like hand washing and, and source water and latrine promotion didn't seem to be very effective at all. So again, this sort of re-emphasize the fact that it's far more than just a water source that a community needs in order to feel ultimate water security. And indeed, when we start to look in, into the literature to see what you know people have done in the past, we got sort of a simple, or you know, th those results um, uh, were consistent with many of our results. This is a large meta-analysis that was done by Peter Hall. It's about 10 years old, but I think these results still have hold. And they looked, uh, and this, they looked at lots and lots of different studies and, and tried to find out which ones were the most effective. And this is in terms of something called the relative risk of diarrhea. And we see that things like source water treatments and even community water connections, we don't even know if those things make diarrhea incidents better or worse. There's so much uncertainty in, in the data. And this is really the best data source. This is the, the paper that everybody cites. We don't even know if those things actually make it better or worse. So there's clearly a lot more complexity in this water system than we are, you know, naively might think. So, but when we think, you know, a little bit more about these problems, um, it becomes a little bit more obvious why a lot of the, or what works best results and some of the other literature is a little bit muddled. And this, I think many of you have seen this diagram. This is the F diagram, and it basically shows how feces can get ingested through all of these different F vectors. Fluids, fields, flies, fingers, and food. All right, and then we have all these different barriers along the way. These have different engineering interventions like latrines and hand washing and boiling or drinking water that can prevent that transmission. However, we can also see from this diagram that we have what we are going to call a complex system, right? Even if you block one of these pathways, you still have many other pathways by which pathogens can get transmitted. So that leads me to the question of what is complex state? And um, when I'm thinking about how I can best present to this, of course I went to YouTube and I found kind of a funny video that I will share with you about complexity. Thank <laughs> you. 
simplifying complexity, okay. <laughs> yeah, so we're thinking about, um, you know, developing more countries and thinking about the F diagram and thinking about my results in Uganda and the other literature in the area. Um, this is really what I'm going to be talking about today. How do we treat these system as what we call defined as a complex system? So what is a, a complex system a little bit more formally defined? Uh, a, compl a complex system is best defined by what it's not. And it's not a complicated system. A complicated system is something like a jet airplane, right, that has many, you know, thousands or even millions of different constituent parts, but we more or less know how all those parts go together to make an airplane fly. On the other hand, you have something like a termite mound, which is also made up of all these different constituent parts, right, the termites, but the behaviors of those individual termites is um, such that they make this, uh, it can be very basic, but it's such that it makes this very complex structure. You cannot, it's very difficult anyway to predict the um, emergent behavior, the creation of a, uh, a termite mount through simply looking at the behaviors of these individual termites. And so that's the difference, and that's how we define a complex system. So we know in a typical water and sanitation system then, in the developing world country, on the one hand, we have the engineered components, right? So we have the water sources, we have maybe hand washing stations, we have latrines, we have sanitary water storage, and all, all the different sort of things that you know engineers like to build. But on the other hand, as a lot of the stuff I think people are talking about today, we also have this, this human element, right? So what water source do people actually use if they have multiple sources? What are their cultural practices? Do people would use the latrines? They go in the bush. Are people treating their water? Are they washing their hands? Are they doing all those things? Are they using some of these engineering systems? And lastly, we have the natural system, right? So we have the local microbiology, the local nutrients, uh, local water resources, the local biota, and the local climate, and in the future, local climate change. So instead of trying to study each one of these different elements individually, I take a more integrated approach. In fact, I bring all of these systems together. So I study what I call the coupled engineered human natural system. And how do I do that? Well, I take a complex systems approach using something called agent-based computer modeling, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a minute, I'll define more fully in a second. And not only that, but when I do this, I think agent-based modeling or any kind of modeling is only as good as the data that you use to perform that. So all the projects I'm going to be talking about today are based on field data, both in terms of the input of the model and also the validation of the models. So what are agent-based models? Well, agent-based models are useful tools for understanding, identifying a lot of the factors that influence the behaviors of these kind of complex systems. And the water and sanitation system in the typical developer world country, as we saw from the F diagram and some of our other results, can be considered this sort of system. There are applications in lots and lots of different fields, uh, economics, public health, ecology, uh, finance, um, uh, many, many other things. Um, and an agent-based model has three main elements. It has agents who give behavior rules and interact in a given environment. But the projects I'm going to be talking to you about today are agents, are people in households. They have certain behavior rules related to what they do every day related to water and sanitation. And they could live in a given environment, which is based on uh, field results. By taking this technique, you can garner additional insight that would be difficult to do using other methods into this complex human engineered natural system. So the first project I'm going to talk about is a project I conducted for my PhD <coughs> research at the University of Virginia in collaboration with the University of Venda in Montopo, South Africa, where we work in the cities of Shapasha and Shibumu, or the communities of Shapasha and Shibumu. And the first thing we did when we got to the communities was we did a lot of water quality testing. And we tested the water quality using total coliform bacteria at both community taps, and these are community taps throughout the city neighborhood, and at the household level. And I think what, what we can see is, is pretty clear here. There's some sort of significant contamination event that occurs between the taps and all of the households. So we want to try to understand 
root causes of disease and the root causes of water contamination in this community. It's not what's going on here, but it's what's going on here. So how do we do that? Well, we took that data, along with a lot of other data from the community that I'll show you in a second, and we developed a computer model, an agent-based computer model. In particular, we developed a water chain model, a very simple model that seemed to reproduce the results pretty well. We have water sources in communities. There are three main water sources, from service water to tap systems, and each one of those has a related quality and reliability. Our agents, remember our people and households, can collect water from either their favorite source or their next favorite source. Water can then become contaminated through um, some, some biological layers on the inside of water storage containers, pans, water transfer devices, and water can be stored for a number of days during which time regrowth can occur. <laughs> then households can choose to treat their water in our model, and that can be done through boiling, filtration, or cleaning out their water storage containers. Then, in the model, the propensity for our agents, for our children, to get sick is based on their water quality and some other factors like hand washing. So, using this sort of method, we can study lots of other different scenarios, lots of what we call counterfactual scenarios. We can try to understand what are the most important risk factors, and uh, then in the future, we can figure out how we might design implementation uh, in order to minimize those risk factors. And we did lots of different analyses, and I'll talk about one of them here for this part of the project. We did what was called a multi-parameter analysis. So if you recall in the last one, I had all those different um, factors about where people collect water from, uh, what the source water quality was, and all these other things. And so basically what we did was we varied all of the parameters at, the, all, at one time. This gets to be very computationally intensive because all the different parameter combinations about 10 or 15 different parameter combinations, each of which we vary different ways. But by doing this, what we did was we identified what are the top 1% of parameter combinations that lead to very, very good outcomes. And what we found was interesting. We found that not everything had to be optimized in order to reach disease rates that were very, very low, very, very low disease rates. But that the most important ones not only had to be optimized, but people had to be really, really good at those. And we found, for instance, that the important ones included this, this biological layer that's on the inside of water storage containers, essentially, you know, non-technical terms, the, the green goo that we saw on the water containers. We also find that, uh, you know, people boiling their water is important. We found the water container type to also be important. We found these ones with the narrow neck containers to be better than the, the wide neck ones like, like this. What we found, surprisingly, things like source water quality, the reliability of the water source, and even the collection frequency of how often people collect water be among the less important parameters. Not saying we shouldn't try to improve source water quality or reliability of other things, but if our goal is to improve, for instance, health in the communities, these are the ones we need to emphasize. So by taking this sort of approach, we've been able to at least partially explain some of the heterogeneity that we saw, for instance, in my work in Uganda and some of the established literature. We see that from this, this study that compliance is key, and that people need to be very consistent about cleaning their water storage containers to prevent this biological layer, boiling their water and other things, but that, and that diarrhea rates could be very, very low if people do so, but that not all of the risk factors have to be optimized in order to achieve that. So the next thing we looked at using um, essentially a very similar extension of the model was ceramic water filters. I think some of you, many of you are probably familiar with these, but in case you're not, this is a household water treatment technology that's quite common in many um, developing world settings. It uses both physical filtration as well as impregnated silver. And they've been found to be highly effective uh, one to five log removal at removing coliform bacteria in both laboratory and field settings. However, what we found is again, we were working in Limpopo, South Africa. Uh, we introduced these ceramic water filters into the community uh, about three, well, longer than that ago, but about three years ago. And we measured the effectiveness of the filters over the course of three years. 
This is in terms of the log reduction value of the filters. And each one of these lines stands for a different filter that we track on the time. And we can see that particularly after two years, the filters are actually pretty, uh, many of them actually contaminate the water. And anecdotally, we found that actually a lot of this contamination is occurring because people are not cleaning out the lower reservoirs, the water storage containers, as well as they probably should be. So although this might have been known in the literature before, we wanted to, to delve a little deeper and try to understand this using our complex system technique. So we took that data along with data about how um, compliance data, so how often people are using these, and we introduced that into the original water chain model that I showed before. And we also found some interesting results in this case. In this case, this is an example of just varying, so keeping all of our 10 or 15 different parameters constant and varying one parameter. And on the left plot is here, this is median household drinking water quality, the median household in terms of coliform bacteria. You note that's a log scale. And this is in terms of mean diarrhea cases on the right. This is cases for two years. What we see here, particularly if we look at the mean diarrhea cases, that um, you know, we're going from about a little over eight all the way down to two at the year zero mark. So this is for basically the average filter in the field. But by the time we get to year one and particularly year three, these filters are almost entirely ineffective as diarrhea prevention tools. What this means from a implementation standpoint is that one, the filters probably don't last three years, and two, that people need to be maintaining them uh, much more better much more um, better than they currently are. So the next thing we looked at was another sort of multi-parameter analysis, a little bit like the one we did before, this data is presented in a slightly different way. In this case, on the y-axis, we have the prevalence of the filters in the community. So what percent of the community have a lot of filters? And on the x-axis, we have compliance. So what percent of the time for people um, using the water filters. And in the color code here, the diarrhea rates in blue are very low, the ones in yellow are um, higher. And what we can see here, and this is for the case where we say that all the filters are 99% effective at removing bacteria, so two, two law reduction values of the filters. And we can see some pretty good results here, diarrhea rates are three or four over a two year period, which is okay. Remember eight was our original value. From, from the last plot. Um, so it's okay, but we find that if we go from two log reduction to three log reduction, we start to see a lot more dark blues. Right? So we say that we've sort of reached a tipping point. What this tells us is that we need to, um, from a design perspective, and from a long-term maintenance perspective, these filters need to be at least 99.9% um, .9 effective. And they, they need to be able to maintain that same effectiveness over the long term in order to be effective. But what we further find is that if we go from three to five log reduction, there's not that much of a difference. There's very little difference between three and five. Again, what this tells us from an engineering design perspective is that um, you know, we need to make sure that they're at three log reduction. Five log reduction is nice, but not necessary. <coughs> but at the same time, compliance is all critical that we need people to be using it um, them quite, quite frequently. Um, so conclusions for this part include the fact that filters are really quite ineffective after three years, that human behaviors are a key element, that log reduction should be at least three and should be maintained there for the long term, and that diarrhea incidents could be very, very low, but only if the filters are used consistently over the long term. Again, we've gotten this information by taking this couple human engineered natural approach to understand all components of the system. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about my current research. And the um, two studies that I just presented um, focused mainly on the human and the engineered components of the system. And now by looking at climate change, we're going to fully integrate what we call the natural part of that system. And I think we all know that climate change is likely to increase temperatures, certainly, and also precipitation variability over the much of the world. And that, of course, this might then very well impact both the hydrology as well as the quality and quantity of water available to developing world communities. 
And in particular, <coughs> this is a study published in Nature of Climate Change and looks at the return time for floods on a global scale. You can see particularly for you know, parts of South Asia, Africa, and, and South America, that floods are likely to be much more common in the future. So then what does the existing literature tell us? Well, generally speaking, all-cause diarrhea, which is when epidemiologists go to the field and just ask the simple question, you know, has your child gotten diarrhea? When they do that, they find that diarrhea incidence tends to increase with increased temperatures and um, both wet and dry seasons in some areas and extreme events like flooding. However, if we look more specifically at pathogen-specific diarrhea, that's diarrhea that can be attributable to a specific pathogen. This is typically done in hospital studies where we do microscopy on, on, the, on the stool samples. Uh, we find that cryptosporidium, which is one of the major causes of disease, is generally, positive, is generally correlated with hot and wet weather, whereas rotavirus is generally associated with cool and dry weather. So one that men they, they might hypothesize, of course, that with climate change, the uh, species distribution might change in the future. Also, prior research shows two general areas. One is that it can be divided into two general areas. One are regional estimates that are, again, typically done by epidemiologists that tend to correlate weather and diarrhea incidents. However, they don't rely on any climate models. So they don't then have any predictive possibilities to try to understand what might happen in the future in the future climates. This is one example of that. It's a study that was conducted in Botswana looked at hospital records of diarrhea over many years, and that's shown in red here. And you can see that it varies, and that varies with rainfall and vapor pressure. But those relationships are certainly not linear. <coughs> on the other hand, there's some global estimates that tend to take these regional data points, and there are really only a few studies globally that have done this, and they generalize their results globally. However, they only rely on temperature. They don't even consider precipitation. They assume a linear response between temperature and diarrhea rates, and they don't tend to rely on any sort of pathogens. So we know that temperature and rainfall are salient variables when speaking about diarrheal diseases. And in turn, we know that climate change is likely to affect both temperature and rainfall in many areas. And we know, of course, that both rainfall and temperature can affect water quality and hence the actual pathogens that can um, cause disease. So again, I'm going to take a couple of approach by taking field data, introducing it into an agent-based model to study this slightly new system. So the field data comes from uh, a group that we're working with at UC Berkeley, it's Karakar and Elson's group. And they've been working in the Twin Cities of Hubli and Darwa. And they've been taking water quality measurements there for a number of years. What they found, this was a public a paper they published last year. This is the um, for the uh, for the course of the year. This is the rainfall and temperature, which varies from, from month to month. This is the water quality that comes out of a municipal water supply. Obviously, a municipal water supply is not very good, and we see substantial seasonal variations in the water quality coming out of this type of supply. We can then hypothesize that in future climates, this water quality is gonna change, and in turn, disease rates might change in turn. <clears throat> so to study this system, we also took an agent-based approach. We use a uh, stochastic weather, weather generator that has global climate models already in it. That then, then the drinking water that's actually available through our agent is a function of this generated weather. We then have a what's called a quantitative microbial risk assessment model that's actually integrated, which translates water quality to disease incidence. And then diarrhea rates can be modified in the model using some epidemiological correlations between the pathogens and disease incidence. This then can get us two things. From an academic standpoint, in a policy standpoint, we can try to understand what the regional climate impacts might be. But more importantly, we can start to think about adaptation strategies. How can we increase the resiliency of such communities under the face of more climate change? 
Um, so these are just validation, a couple of validation slides to show you the model works okay. This is the temperature departure from normal along with diarrhea rates on the y-axis. And we can see clearly that uh, diarrhea rates um, increase with increased temperatures. Or if we look for rain at rainfall, they tend to decrease. This is a, in terms of a rainfall multiplier. So basically we just took the rainfall and multiplied it by a certain, certain amount. We see the rainfall amount <coughs> then is negatively correlated with disease incidence. The more rainfall, the lower incidence of disease but clearly not linear function at all, as with the temperature. So what are some of the results of this study? <coughs> well, um, again, diarrhea incidence is shown on the y-axis here. And these are three different uh, time periods that correspond to the uh, weather generator and climate model um, uh, output data. And this is early century, mid-century, and late century. And the reason why we have so many different data points here because these are all the different climate models that are integrated into it, along with all the different climate scenarios which are also integrated, integrated into it. What we see is that clearly there's a lot of heterogeneity and a lot of difference between what different climate models tell us. But what we do see is generally increasing then trend in diarrhea rates towards the end of the century, which is consistent with, generally speaking, um, you know, more, the water quality is likely to get Available to these residents is likely to get poorer and poorer. However, um, we see two interesting things here is that the model predicts that rotavirus incidence, rotavirus is actually really the number one cause of disease uh, globally, diarrheal disease globally, tends to decrease, but cryptosporidium tends to increase. So we have these two, two, different, um, you know, two different trends for the two different pathogens. Which leads me to my next slide, and that's adaptation. How can we use that information to help us, help communities adapt under future climates? Well, um, in this case, I looked at two different adaptation strategies. One are the ceramic filters that I talked about a little bit before. And the second is uh, point of use chlorination, which is also obviously a very common technique. We know that <coughs> these um, ceramic water filters are very good at removing bacteria like E. coli and cryptosporidium, which are, of course, big microorganisms, but they're very poor at removing rotavirus. On the other hand, cryptos uh, cryptosporidium is not removed very well at all by chlorination. So what are some of the results of this part? Well, again, this is in terms of diarrhea incidence on the y-axis, and that there are different time periods on the x-axis. First of all, you can notice that, you know, no matter what we choose, um, you know, assuming that people are good and consistent about using it. And either the technologies can work pretty well in terms of redoing, reducing diarrhea from baseline incidents. But what we also see is that particularly by the end of the century, ceramic filters are likely to become increasingly more effective over time. This is a direct function of the fact that cryptosporidium, according to our models, is predicted to get worse and worse in the future, as rotavirus might actually, incidents might actually decrease even though the water quality in the community might, uh, might be getting worse. <coughs> so, uh, a couple of comments and, and um, conclusions about this part of the study include the fact that climate change is likely to have a moderately small um, impact on diarrhea rates in these cities. However, as I mentioned before, this is a municipal water supply in, um, in a city that has relatively small seasonal supply variations and it's also in a generally growing economy. If we take the same study and can't, that means that we really can't take sort of this study and these conclusions of this study and apply it to maybe a rural part of Panama or other areas. That's part of my future work, but, uh, but for this study, we have to be a little bit careful about, you know, about these results. We also see that pathogen, looking at the, exactly the different pathogens, as well as the rainfall, are two very, very highly relevant um, to the system. Yet no study has actually looked at either rainfall or pathogens to try to predict diarrhea in the future. This is the first study that's ever attempted that. And we also see, or in the last results, the ceramic filters are likely to be um, a better pick going future. Um, you know, I say ceramic filters here, but also other sorts of filter technologies that can get rid of larger pathogens. So um, I've taken you on 
my personal journey, uh, taking me from Michigan Tech to UVA to Yale and my future work at, at UConn, which I haven't talked about, but I'll also be working a lot on the climate drivers of water quality and disease in, in that area. It's a journey that, that's taken me from Guatemala and, and constructing a, a water source for that community, all the way up to my future work on the climate drivers of disease rates in developing countries. It's also a journey that's taken me from an understanding that you know, we need to do more than just worry about the water supply. Indeed, there are lots of different drivers that are real diseases. Uh, we have, certainly based on my work, probably many more questions um, than answers, but at least we're starting on the path of trying to understand all the different complexities of water and health in developing world countries. I want to take just a second at the end, too, to talk about, I've talked a lot about um, the water and sanitation system in uh, developing world countries. But I think as we've heard from a lot of talks today, and I'm sure we'll hear in the afternoon, there are so many other different challenges as well. From biodiversity loss, to talk a little bit about um, um, household uh, energy needs, to ambient air pollution, to transportation, to indoor air pollution, and, and food, and, and sanitation, overcrowding, and all of the other sorts of things. And I think although I focused on water and sanitation, I think we can extrapolate from the results from this one system that all of these different things, none of these things, is there really a single civil goal. There's not one answer to try to understand what is going to work best in the entire disease prevention, any more than there is one answer to any of these other problems. As one example of this, this is a plot that shows the rainfall variability versus the GDP in Ethiopia. This is over, I guess, the course of about 20 years, 1980 to And you can see remarkable trend lines here going up and down, right? A lot of correlation between rainfall and GDP growth in Ethiopia. Right? So this is a classic example of a very non-resilient system, right? We do not want to see so much seasonal variation, particularly in the face of the future climate. So one question, one future question that we, we hope to ask and, and hope to answer at the University of Connecticut is, for instance, how do we use you know, seasonal prediction tools that can better inform farmers and other water managers about what the future might hold in terms of water precipitation so that they can make better decisions? How do we communicate that science to local farmers in order to, for instance, improve crop yield? We know that there are, although there are right now less than a billion people in the world who don't have access to water, there are well over two billion people who don't have access to adequate sanitation. And so what are, well we have some idea what are the um, barriers to, to water and non-water, um, the water and non-water barriers to uh, uh, the global sanitation coverage, but how do we overcome those barriers in order to achieve the Millennium Development Goals for, for sanitation, particularly in the face of climate variability. There are about 3 billion people in the world who use, cook and heat their homes using open fires and simple biomass stoves. We know that this leads to about 4 million deaths every year from um, poor indoor air quality, which is of course directly linked to um, uh, child morbidity and mortality, both ambient air pollution and everything else. We also know that by 2030, the world is projected to have about 41 megacities. These are cities with over 10 million people. How are we going to manage the complex overcrowding, the sanitation, the transportation, the ambient air pollution? How are we going to manage all these different areas going forward in the future? And, you know, we have two objectives, right? So we have to, at the one time, make sure that people and livelihoods, and there can be proper human security in these areas that people can live happy, productive lives. On the other hand, we have to make sure that we maintain the, our natural environment so that natural environment can continue to provide the natural resources that we need in order to maintain that environment. So the last thought I want to leave you with is what we call the nexus, which I think many of you have heard about. I think that a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the work I want to do in the future is really water and climate and air and health and food and land and technology and energy. 
all of these different areas intersect with each other. And I argue that the people in this room and environmental engineers and other people are really uniquely positioned given that we are all broadly multidisciplinary audience and have lots of different skill sets. We really are uniquely positioned in order to answer many of these challenging nexus areas. How are energy, climate, water related? How are air, health related, food and technology and water? How all, what is the intersection between these different areas? And how can we, as uh, environmental um, professionals, look forward in the future towards answering some of these many global challenges that we face in the future. So um, with that, that's the end of my talk, but thank you very much. Welcome, any questions?